Well, guys, must be the last day. I wanted to begin this last class by talking a little bit about this quiz six that I ask you to take a look at. And some of you are, have actually done some work on. Uh, and I've talked with a few of you and uh, it seemed to me that it would, I need to clear some of this up. First of all, this is a two part question and it's two pages, one page for each question. And I'm hoping you can get enough information to fill out one page for each part. Um, let's look at the first question. How has the role of the Western artist, Western's an operative word here, because there are some cultures in which uh, non-Western cultures where some of the art has remained traditional and they practice their art the same way that they've done a thousand, two thousand, three thousand years ago. I had one person tell me that there were millions of generations, but I thought that was a little hyperbolic because I think that Homo sapiens are only like 2 million years old. So that would be every generation would be two years. And secondly, we don't have any artworks that go back past about 30, 40,000 years ago. But we're just talking about the last 500 years, which is the scope of this book, 1400 onward. Um, and so don't tell me that, yes, the role has changed the way this question is set up. That should be a given. What I want you to produce is some evidence that it has changed. This is not a debatable point. And that leads me to the second question, how has it stayed the same over the last 500 years? And if you think it's mostly the same, you can write about that. But let me give you some examples about how Western art has changed. One, sponsorship of art. That has changed. Five, six hundred years ago, it was basically under the thumb and under the sponsorship of the monarchs and the church. And really, the church was the primary uh, sponsor of almost all the art that you see. Uh, and I've been talking about this idea, hopefully through the semester, but I want you to remember this, and this may be another way to tackle this too. You could look at it. I've been talking about how the artists over time have written their own narratives. That's why I've been talking about that. And so the narrative, when uh, art was under the control of the church was going to be primarily religious subject matter. And as we developed a middle class and we see the rise of capitalism, we start to see a little bit of private, wealthy, middle class, upper class people commissioning their own artwork. That starts in the Renaissance. That's what we talk about, the Arnold Feeney marriage, for example. Arnold Feeney was something of a trade representative. 
He was a commercial entrepreneur. He was doing trading back and forth from Northern to Southern Europe. He made a lot of money when he was in Bruges, where Van Eyck was from. He got Van Eyck to paint their portrait. But if you look at the whole of Van Eyck's work, there are some portraits, but the vast majority of the work that he created was religious. And this goes to that point, so the sponsorship. But by the time we get to the 20th century, artists writing their own narrative completely, they're not under the auspices of the church. And in a lot of ways, they're not even under the auspices of the wealthy. They're mostly doing what they want to do, which is why some end up dying for with one ear, for example. But the role changes, and it's a gradual change. Some of the artists start doing realism, and they start doing paintings about the stonebreakers or the third class carriage, that sort of thing. Real people, ordinary people, the potato eaters, to get another good example. Artists writing their own narratives and concentrating, focusing their work on ordinary people, which would not have ever, ever, never, never been done 500 years ago. So those are the kind of changes. And it's not a single flip of the light switch or the power button. It's something that happens over time. That's why I think you can get a page out of that. How has it stayed the same over the past 500 years? Well, I think that uh, we might start talking about things like trying to appeal to the audience, to the people, to move them, to, in a lot of ways, bring them beauty, bring them piety. By that, I mean inspire them to be more religious, to bring them... Uh, almost like bring them the gospel, if you will. Uh, and even though that is happening, there are others that even today, they're bringing the gospel too, but the gospel they're preaching might have to do with human rights or gender equality. Or it might have something to do with, go back a few years, it might be about the nature of creating illusionistic art. Ah, what am I talking about? Picasso, a whole different way of creating a visual subject matter message in his own language. And he talked about, as I said in here before, how illusionism was a lie. Or you can talk about subject matter all the way through how it stayed the same because there is still some of that that kind of what you might call what would you call that I, propaganda is the word that comes to mind but no uh not propaganda how about evangelism? Same kind of uh, preaching your point of view, trying to make people see things your way. And artists do that. They've done it 1400. They do it in 2013. And so those are the kinds of threads, and there are many. But that is really what I'm looking for, 
don't give me the Western art has changed over 500 years. Yeah, that's true. Right? There's a lot of things that are a lot different than they were 500 years ago. How has it stayed the same? Oh, well, it's, you know, it's still art. They still use paint and, and stuff. So anyway, I'm talking about this right now because I want to make sure you guys got it. And so Victor's here. I'm going to give you credit. Is that clear? All right. Well, and this is my PowerPoint for today. Last call. And I got to apologize for... The fact that we're like looking at four, five chapters, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, all at one time. They're at the end. And in part, it's because culture, history, a lot of factors have we still have this art history as something outside of the Western art history, which is what we were looking at. At the end, the last couple of weeks, I was showing you global art, and I was showing you artists from all over the world. But let me explain. So anyway, first, I wanted to see these are the chapters. South and Southeast Asia, 1200 to 1980, 1279 to 1980. You see a, a through line here. Japan, 1333 to 1980. Oceania, before 1980. Native American cultures, 1300 to 1980. And Africa, this is a real short one, 1800 to 1980. That's not even two whole centuries. So why is it like this? I think there, we can look to history to kind of explain some of this. And the history book that we're using, the art history book, is really kind of, uh, how should I say, it reflects a lot of things that had gone on in history over time. And probably the biggest, if you will, elephant in a room is this, colonization. And what we have here, all of those chapters that I'll show you, they begin with a map because they want to show you all of these various places around the world that is not Europe. And so we're basing all of this, and even my final quiz question has the word Western art and European, and by extension, actually North American, South American to some extent. But here's what happened, the Europeans, began colonizing the world in the late 15th century. 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Yeah, from a bad song, poetry. But at any rate, how did that happen? And, and I want to kind of throw all of these ideas out because uh, all of these all of these bullet points really have um, significance. First of all, firearms. Europeans, they had firearms. They had rifles, they had muskets, they had pistols. So where they went and they wanted to subjugate the local population, which usually resulted in a war 
a conflict of some type, Europeans prevailed because what you had were local populations globally that were literally bringing their knives to a gunfight, if you will. It made subjugating all of these populations actually possible, that you had firearms. It's, a, it's weapons technology. It was a jump forward, uh, even though the Chinese invented gunpowder, it was the Europeans that put it to use in cannon and in long rifles and subsequently in pistols. And as you know, firearms, there, there's not a lot you can do. Firearms are kind of the top of the line when it comes to weapons technologies. And the second thing they had, ships and navigation. And they developed ships that could cross the ocean. Now, were they the first ones? No, not really. I mean, technically the, um, the Vikings are European and they crossed over the North Atlantic and we have evidence that they actually settled in parts of what is today, North America. We know that. And there were other cultures that had ships too that could cross vast distances. The people of Polynesia could do that. They set out on boats and they went from island to island. They actually populated the entire Pacific Ocean. All of the islands that you see in the South and North Pacific, these people we know migrated from Southeast Asia all the way across. They settled in Hawaii, Easter Island. It was like people from all over. I mean, people went all over. And to do that, they had to be able to navigate. And they were good at that, but they're basically, their navigation was not, uh, well, they did it by the stars. And at night, they could tell which way they knew the night sky and they could navigate. But what the Europeans added to the mix was the compass. Didn't have to wait till nighttime to know which way north was know which direction you are sailing. Um, and so that was kind of yet another technological breakthrough. And then around 1800, Europe had another technical breakthrough, mechanical power, steam engines. That was what fueled the industrial revolution was steam engines because factories before that could actually mass produce, but they would put their factories like right next to a river and would do it with water power. And you can see a lot of that in the American Northeast places like Massachusetts and Connecticut and so on, where their textile mills were powered by water mills. But steam engines, that was a breakthrough. You had engines that could be strapped onto a lot of things, especially boats, especially trains. You had this power source that was infinitely more powerful than what existed before because before steam, steam engines, and you could maybe get a stream to kind of power your textile mill, but bottom line, the only real power you ever had was 
human labor or draft animals. And a lot of cultures have put draft animals to good use, and especially go to Asia, they could do amazing things with elephants, elephants being very strong, pretty smart, and you and they could help you lift those big timbers or those big stones. They could do a lot of the heavy lifting, as they say. But steam engines, that was like huge. Europe had a large population. It's kind of hard to take over other places, colonize those places. If you don't have a big population, to kind of take hold and settle there. That's what happened in the original 13 colonies. They were basically, by and large, British, but there were Spanish and French and other Europeans, but bottom line, that's how you take over. You settle it, put your guys in there. And Europe had a population large enough to actually do some of that stuff. Another thing, central government. Say, hey, well, what, what the heck? The colonial superpowers of the last 500 years had central government. French were French, Brits were Brits, Spanish were Spanish. Had a king, had a ruler. They functioned together. It was a break from the ancient European model of a city state. A city state, there were places in Italy that still used the city state. They were not organized as Italy until like the 1860s. And Germany was kind of the same way. They were kind of municipalities and stuff. Germany was not a great colonial power in this age of the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries, 19th centuries for that. But places like Spain, France, England, Portugal, tiny little Portugal, Brazil being a Portuguese colony, the biggest, one of the biggest countries in the modern world, Portuguese colony. And so central government allowed them to do that. And I'll add this, there were a lot of places around the world that did not have central government. For instance, North America, we talk about the native people, but they were many different people. They weren't this unified group. They didn't have what you would call a national identity. They would have what is kind of, I, I hate to use the word tribal, but it is, it's a tribal identity. And sometimes those Native Americans were actually at war with each other. And if you know about Native American culture, indigenous culture, you'll know that some of these groups, some of these communities, some of these tribes have still a great deal of animosity. They're like, they have their enemies sworn blood enemies and it predates colonization. People, a lot of people don't know that, but it is true. So why am I bringing this up? Take another place that was colonized, India. India today is a big, huge country with a billion people, but for much of its history, it was organized into not really city-states, but different provinces. There were different kinds of people, and they spoke different languages. And they still do in a lot of places in India. So it's kind of like how North America was, except heavily 
more heavily populated, but that was a factor because the British colonizers made, made peace or made alliances with certain people against other people too. It was really kind of a, a big, big thing, but that's how a large country, if it's not organized, a European country can come in and colonize. Another thing that they did, and this is part of the whole colonization, colonization in a lot of ways was an economic construct. Because what you do is you move in and take what you want. And that might even go so far as to take the people and enslave them, which is what happened in West Central Africa. European colonizers, they couldn't get into Africa proper, but they could, they had a hold right there on the West Central coast and they took people, kidnapped them, enslaved them. And so uh, what did this result in? Cultural hegemony. Because all of this colonization kind of imposed the European model all over the world. It's not universal. And many places in this world have kept their national, traditional identities, but European culture, as it dominated the economics, dominated even the very cultures of these places. And so why do I say that? English. Why is everybody speaking English? English, England itself was one of the biggest colonizers and had more territories than any other European power. And so when they move in, English becomes the official language. And so that's why you can go over the world and you can find people by and large who do speak English. That's part of that cultural hegemony. And along with the language, our culture has imposed itself as being the dominant culture, which is why the book is set up like it is. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's wrong, but it is what it is. And so, Africa, Asia, and the Americas. This is where all of those colonies were in the colonial era. And uh, as I say, the Europeans had a wide range of technologies that allowed them, that enabled them to kind of go in and if you say, set up shop, colonize these people around the world, and one of the things that uh, is, is part of this mixture, written language versus oral history. And these, these things aren't absolute, but there are many places in the colonized world where all we have is oral history because some, some cultures never developed an oral language, and that gets down to my bottom point. If it's working, don't fix it. For a lot of for a lot of societies, having an oral historian was good enough. And I'll give you some examples. Uh, how many of you seen? You know, which is now fifty years old, but they still show it. roots was one of the mini series that was aired on ABC in the 1970s. And it was based on a book by 
an African American retired Coast Guard uh, officer. And his name was Alex Haley. And he was a writer. He actually co wrote the autobiography of Malcolm X, worked with Malcolm X. And he was a great writer. And he wrote Roots, which was about his journey as an African American trying to find his history. And so, he went through a lot of the things that historians go through now, trying to find records in the slavery era, who was sold to who, who lived on what plantation, et cetera, et cetera. When did the boat come with the slaves? Who got sold to what? You know, stuff like that. And it was an enormously successful book. And they made this miniseries, an epic miniseries out of it. And it was still one of the landmark histories of ever. Anyway, Alex Haley himself didn't just stop at when his ancestors were brought over on a slave ship. He went over to Ghana and wanted to find where his ancestors were from who his ancestors were pre-enslavement. And he had the name, the African name of one of his great, 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 great grandfathers. His name was Kunta Kinte. And what did Alex Haley do, which was a stroke of genius? He went around to all of these villages that had oral historians. And he would ask the oral historian, give me your history. And the oral historian could go back and name all of the people in their, in their culture over time. And he got this one that he heard it when the guy was going back a couple of hundred years and it couldn't take and take. Boom, I found him. This is where. I'm from. And so you say, well, it, that's probably not efficient, is it? Let me tell you. Oral historians actually are pretty reliable, as we've been finding out. Cultures that have oral histories, they correspond. And um, they correspond with the other evidence that we're able to unearth, as they say. Uh, but uh, the human mind properly trained, we have people who can recite <laughs> pi to the 40,000th digit correctly. You ever see this? Read about this? There are people that can actually do that. If you train your mind, and that's what the oral historian would do, his or her life would be spent. That was their job. They were the history book of their people. And so, what other examples can I come up with? I can go back to the Old Testament in the Bible. Early on, you ever see these passages of Ham or what? Now I'm trying to remember the names. Anyway, they go, somebody begat somebody. Somebody had to begat two sons and a daughter whose names were blah, blah, blah. There's a big part of the Old Testament that reads exactly like it came from an oral historian. And so, anyway, when you don't have written language, it, it, it's, it's a thing. But written language, obviously, can, is very efficient. You don't have to have an oral historian. What if the guy gets sick and dies and you lose your history? But uh, various degrees of organized central government, and that's what I was saying earlier, this was 
part of the Achilles heel, if you will, of a lot of cultures, they, they weren't organized well enough to repel the colonizers. And the colonizers actually um, took advantage of internal and external rivalries. And that's why I was talking about Native American cultures where, uh, where two different peoples or many different peoples may have, they may be sworn enemies. Uh, and so many other things too. There are graph, uh, geographic natural boundaries. And there are some places that didn't get colonized right away. For example, uh, that kind of accounts for, if I could go back up here, Africa, 1800 to 1980, aside from West Central Africa, the main part of the continent, the central part of the continent, it was, nobody was able to even travel there. The climate, the vegetation, large man-eating animals and snakes and all kinds of things are not the most hospitable place. And so, so that central part of Africa may uh, maintain their independence. They were unaffected by a lot of this stuff. And then there are other things like mountains and things too that will inhibit colonizers. And um, and so what do we get from this? I should have put natural, natural resources. And if there are natural resources in a place, it's more likely to get colonized. Because like I said, this is an economic history. It's really about making a lot of money. And, uh, and then there were a lot of the priorities. The other part of this is, is that a lot of these people around the world were just not interested in colonizing. A lot of people were just okay being who they were, staying where they were. Uh, and so anyway, the idea of it's working, don't fix it. That plays into it, you know. And so today, I uh, brought this in. A little bit of vanity here, I guess. But last week or the week before, St. Louis Speaker Series, hosted by Maryville, I got to see this guy, Thomas Friedman. I don't know if you've heard of him. He's a thinker. He's a writer. Uh, and this is one of the books that he wrote. This was from a while back. Uh, but it, this is kind of the synopsis here. But I'll read this part. Thomas Friedman demystifies Brave New World the brave new world for readers, allowing them to make sense of the often bewildering global scene unfolding before their eyes with his intimidable, inimitable ability to translate complex foreign policy and economics issues. Friedman explains how the flattening of the world happened at the dawn of the 21st century. And so that was, in its own way, the global arc that I showed you, chapter 33, or excuse me, 32, all of that stuff from Yinka Shona Bear and uh, Marisol and just people from all over the globe, El Anatsui. It's because the world's flat. The world's flat and we're much more readily interconnected. It's just something that perhaps you could take for granted today. And when we're interconnected, we have this phenomenon 
of cross pollinization. And that is that influence is spread back and forth quite easily and quite rapidly. And so these last chapters, these are the traditional arts of these various places. And you'll find this is India and South Asia. And so they have traditional art. I mean, they always had, it's an ancient culture. And uh, this is, this is kind of an interesting uh, painting. See, it's in 1615, 16 opaque watercolor on paper. And what you'll find with a lot of this two-dimensional art, watercolor and ink, basically what a lot of the rest of the world used. But look at these figures. And this is truly from South Asia. Uh, but you can see some of the Arabic script. You can see the angels. You can see this guy. He looks like a 17th century European right there next to next to a 17th century, probably Muslim, going by the turban. And, and so anyway, here it is. This is cross-pollinization. This is like exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, and so these are all examples from uh India, at least for a while here, in Delhi, India. Uh, we have the spread in India predating colonization. We have Islam comes in uh, and is very uh, influential in many parts of India, not everywhere. Hinduism still is the dominant religion, but Islam, uh, Lotus Mahal, some rock cut, uh, a lot of times what they do in their work, and see this is uh, opaque watercolor on paper, as I was saying. This is about a battle. And here is the town, this is the fortress, and these are the invaders, and again, their technology was these huge draft animals, which was high tech for the day. Didn't have steam engines, you know what I'm saying. But uh, watercolor on paper. And you see where these things are from. London. Again, when colonizers come in, they they take a lot of their artwork back home. And in fact, I got some examples of that here. Uh, opaque watercolor and gold on paper. Taj Mahal, one of the most magnificent buildings of the whole world. And it's in India, Agra, India. And it's Islamic architecture. And the Raja, the ruler of this part of India at the time was Muslim. And this is sort of a monument to his favorite, the die too early wife. And so this is a tribute to her. But look, it's And you can see the Islamic parts of it, the minarets, the dome. Etc. And let me get a. Oh, I got the next slide. It'll show you the idea of this is like common in Islamic architecture. Not seeing pictures of saints and other holy people or people at all because typically that's not done. It's a 
one of the, I think it's the second commandment. Is that right? Thou shalt not create false images, adore false idols. Anyway, they take that seriously, but the motifs and these motifs with Arabic writing and typically verses from the Quran. Um, traditional Hindu, Krishna and the gopis. And uh, a lot of these things actually exist as this is watercolor on paper. A lot of these are from books to like the deep book of the Here's the kind of temple that Polkett was talking about. The great temple looking southeast. Hindu temples, very elaborate. And you see, this is the 17th century, so it's the 1600s. It's a little newer than Gothic cathedrals, but you see, very similar in their own kinds of ways. Tall, monumental structure devoted to a religion. And so anyway, here we go, Mumbai. Victoria Terminus, which is basically a train station. Mumbai, India, 1878-1887. European architecture right there in the capital. Right, oh, it's not, no, not New Delhi. It's, I'm getting it all mixed up, I'm sorry. Bottom line, one of the biggest cities. Uh, and so here, that's that cross-polymerization that I'm talking about. Uh, and to some extent, this kind of portrait is out of the Western European playbook too. When you see that it's got three-dimensional space, it's uh, and so on. And on the other hand, this is 1905, traditional Hindu portrayal where Bharat Mata, Mother India, got four arms. That's like a real Hindu thing. And that doesn't mean that she has four arms. It's just a representation that she can do different things based on what she has in her hands. And so we see a lot of uh, Hindu deity portrayed that way. Uh, and this, somebody going retro, doing work, Ashoka at Kalinga, 1972. And there are on these chapters examples of artists who are working in the traditional styles with traditional subject matter. And so we'll go into Southeast Asia, uh, Wat Chai uh, Temple in Thailand, a walking Buddha. One of the things about Buddhism is that it began in India and spread east and south. And so much of Southeast Asia had been Buddha. And this is from Thailand. And as it spread, the idea of how to portray the Buddha was changing as well. Because typically, a Buddha was always depicted like this, cross-legged, contemplative, the idea of a walking Buddha, that's almost like, in some ways, kind of contradictory of the Buddha, because it's always in a meditative state, but here we go. But in depicting Buddha from Thailand, or you go to China, or you go to Japan, 
they all have their cultural identities on this Buddha. And this would be a Thai Buddha, much different than a Chinese with the headdress, the ornamentation, and so on. Uh, this is from Myanmar. And this is 14th century or earlier, but rebuilt several times. And you'll see that in a lot of these uh, examples. Yeah, here it is. Pa uh, Tat Duong in Laos, rebuilt 1931 to 35. Dish with two minor birds from Vietnam. And so what you see in Southeast Asia, if you want to take a kind of a 40,000 foot look at all of this, you see in Southeast Asia, a lot of influence from India, a lot of influence from China, because this looked like this could actually be Chinese uh, in a lot of respects. Uh, and a lot of local identity putting their own mark on some of these traditional arts. So China during the Ming Dynasty, here we go, uh, Forbidden City, probably this and the Great Wall, the two main architectural accomplishments of ancient Chinese culture. Bottom line, still there. This is the Forbidden City, and here's the gate to it. Uh, and you can see this is a somewhat 20th century addition to this, Chairman Mao, Mao Zedong's portrait. But uh, another traditional art, we'll see this in China, Japan, Korea typically scroll ink on paper. And they have these stamps and they use red ink and they put these identity marks on it. But typically Chinese style, and this is circa 1300. Hand scroll ink on paper. And they do a lot of drawing. They incorporate poetry, uh, sometimes uh, sayings from Confucianism or something, uh, or just uh, just poetry itself. Bottom line, this becomes one of the major art forms in China. And here we go, 1347. 1347. Hanging scroll ink on paper, poetry, imagery. Here was one that I was thinking about when I said that colonizers take what they want, which are called the David Basics. And it's uh, from the Sir Percival David Foundation of Chinese Art. And it's in London in the British Museum. And this is kind of like, in fact, not unlike the Elgin marbles that Lord Elgin took from the Acropolis that were the part pediment uh, statues of the Parthenon itself, put them on his boat, took them back to England. They're called the Elgin marbles now, or at least they will until maybe they'll repatriate them. But um, Phoenix Pavilion, Great Mosque. See, it, I was going to show you this too. In China, a lot of this Western area went Islam. And in fact, keep up with the news. See, a lot of Buddhists here in the Himalayas and uh, Tibet and Nepal, but over here, a lot of Islamic followers, a lot of Islamic people. 
And they're actually, as we speak, government of China is trying to get rid of them. How many of you ever heard of the Uyghurs? Oh, well, they're the indigenous Islamic Chinese that are in Western China. And they're being pretty much uh, persecuted, just to put it mildly. So anyway, uh, what we have, traditional, traditional art, traditional architecture, um, A lot of their art in furniture, scroll ink and colors on silk. Again, this is so traditional Chinese. And the, as you see, this is 1617, 1627, 1707. These things don't change over the century. This is Chinese traditional art. Um, and so you start to see a little bit of Western influence. You can see this is kind of a little bit more Western with the insertion of the color and so on. But rent collection courtyard. 1965. And so these little figurines, they find these in uh, tombs of emperors, and you have Yi, Yushan, and others, and they kind of recreate traditional Chinese art. That's why it's in this chapter, not in the other chapter, because it says uniquely Chinese. And they would have these little figurines of everyday people doing everyday things. And you can see uh, this is a rich person. This is his bodyguard. This is somebody begging forgiveness. I know I owe you money, but, you know, and have some people working and stuff. Korea, highly influenced by Chinese. Korea is in an interesting place geographically and culturally. Because at various times, the Chinese considered the Koreans Chinese, and at various other times, Japanese saw the Koreans as Japanese. But at any rate, see the Chinese influence here. And here's modern Japan. And so this is 1857. This is. And, and we don't go that far back in the Japanese culture, um, partly because they were a closed culture. But what we do have looks to be very highly influenced by the same kind of aesthetic principles that we see in Korea and in China. This is something that's a little different. Moss Garden. One of the things that that differentiates Japan from the other countries is the kind of Buddhism that they practice. And so they were really into Zen Buddhism and Shinto Buddhism. And Zen Buddhism is this connection with the earth. And so doing gardens like that, or rock gardens and things like this, this connection to the earth and saying, you know, as you would know, in in the Western sense, this is not a garden. This is this fact they kind of got rid of some of the trees and stuff, you know, but it's that connection to the natural world, as it is this. And this kind of interbalance between manipulating that. And letting it influence you. It's kind of a two way thing. Um, and so, Chinese lions, this is really kind of cool too, because oftentimes we find in some of this old art, 
species that no longer exist. I'm not sure about the Chinese lions, but I know Asiatic lions are depicted in uh, Assyrian reliefs and stuff. But anyway, pine forest, very much like um, another art form, China, Korea, Japan, ceramics. And so this is uh, the Imperial Villa. And so late, early 17th century, it's called the Edo period. Edo was the, his modern day Tokyo. And it's when that city became the center. Uh, but see, you know, Edo period. It's just very, very similar. And this. Hokusai, Hokusai, excuse me. This is like a real famous woodcut cut print. In fact, this has kind of jumped from being traditional Japanese art to being like global art because it's so popular. You can buy t-shirts with this and stuff. I mean, it's, it is a masterpiece. And, and so I wanted to kind of go back a little bit in that, like this, oh, wait, wait. What did I have? Oh, I lost it. It's here somewhere. Okay, this, this, these are woodblock prints. And what happened when the Japanese started trading with the rest of the world, this was the kind of art that would show up in Europe and inspired, as I talk about this cross pollinization, the idea of flat colors, this just this pattern that goes here, but it doesn't follow the shape the form of the cloth and stuff. All of these post-impressionist people like me go, they went wild. And I said, yes, this is genius. And so anyway, this is Japanese architecture, 20th century. Um, and this is traditional ceramics done by, done in modern times, 1958. And Shiraga, this guy, making a work with his own body. This is like performance art. And so in the 1950s, all of this stuff that I showed you about performance art and stuff that was going on in the 50s and 60s, uh, earth art and things, Japanese world, right in there. And I could actually point to somebody that maybe you know, certainly important to me, Yoko Ono. Do you know Yoko Ono? No, I'm old. She married John Lennon, the Beatle. She married him, or she struck up a relationship with him in the mid 60s and they, they got married and Remain married until he was assassinated. Yoko Ono was right in the middle of those global art trends that I'm showing you right here. And she knew a lot of American artists and European artists and stuff. And she introduced John Lennon to a lot of those very same ideas. And I'm not sure that she gets the credit she deserves, but you know, the Beatles history, they were kind of like a boy band, pop band, and then their work got like really experimental 
Sergeant Peppers and stuff like that. And they were doing all kinds of things that really kind of tied into what was going on in the art world at the time. And I could elaborate on that and actually point to people that they all know. But just to say, the world was flattening. And so um, the American art, and you see we've got three maps here. We've got South America, Mesoamerica, North America. And again, as I was saying at the beginning of this, you got various different peoples. And so if you wanted English coming this way or French coming down this way or Spanish coming up this way, it's kind of a piece of cake to colonize this because these people are all different cultures. They're small groups. They're kind of like the European city-states. They have no centralized government. If all of these folks had a centralized government and they could raise a centralized army, they would have probably driven all these guys off their continent. But it didn't happen that way. But these people all have their own cultures. And I think I got to give it up. I got Africa, Oceania, and America. But I'm running out of time. I won't be able to do it well. I want you to kind of take a look at this before. It's only on the video because I uh, wait I don't have I lost the ability to put my powerpoints on canvas they can hit I don't know something crashed they can't help me that's why I've been doing this on flash drive but at any rate I think we can call it a semester and if you look at the book and you see those last few chapters, just kind of remember the things that I said. There, these modern day countries were really a patchwork of various peoples. Africa, different peoples. There's no like one Africa. There's like different people all over the continent as it was in South America, as it was in Asia as it was in India. And so we have those traditional arts from those people, and we still have people making arts in those traditions. And I gotta, I'm gonna even break my word here. Maria Martinez. See, this is 1934. This is somebody I actually knew about for a long time. Pueblo, Pueblo people, New Mexico. Anyway, traditional art, modern day people doing art the way that their ancestors had done for a long time. All of these chapters have the traditional and the practitioners in modern day. And why is it that way? Because they don't fit into the construct of Western art. Not until the world got a lot more flat, as Thomas Friedman said. So, got one more request. Fill out the student evaluation survey, please. Um, it's important for the school. It's important to me. I don't get like, I won't know who voted what and i won't know who said what but your comments i do look at them and better or worse they they make me better so hope to see you guys next semester which would be like stop by sometime good luck with your education and thank you
Thank you. It's nice to meet you. Yes, you too, Emma. Take care. You bet. See you, man. You. Say, you. say hi to your mom. Tell her you had a Truman oh, professor. Well. Okay, good. <laughs>